Hey guys, so today we are talking about the women's movement, and so that is going to include talking about feminism. So I want to clarify what feminism is before we even start this lecture, excuse me, and get into the women's movement. Feminism means the equality between men and women in society, job opportunities, educational opportunities, any and all areas of life and that acceptance. It does not mean for the fighting of women over men. Um, I feel like that's something that some people think it's what it means and it doesn't mean that militants or anything like that it just means fighting for equality. Okay, so we are going to start of talking about kind of these foundational pieces that then are going to lead into the women's movement that allow that that foundation for the women's movement for later. And one of those foundational pieces is going to be the Great Society. The Great Society is going to be a program created by Lyndon B. Johnson. Lyndon B. Johnson is the vice president for JFK when JFK is assassinated and LBJ becomes president. And when LBJ becomes president, he follows through on a lot of the principles and ideas that JFK was fighting for, which include things like civil rights movement. And then Lyndon B. Johnson, LBJ, will be elected for his own term and when he's elected for his own term, he is really focused on making this impact, and that impact is going to be the Great Society. And the Great Society is going to be a program that he creates that is intended to provide greater social services for the elderly and the poor. He calls it the war on poverty. He's like, you know, we got to help provide for these American citizens for these levels of societies that are not having the same opportunities. So he's talking about providing things like youth programs and anti-poverty measures, small business loans, job opportunity, like training, um, <clears throat> and things of that nature. And ultimately, in 1965, Congress is going to pass a lot of the Great Society bills through um, through Congress, through legislation. They include things like Medicare, the Civil Rights Legislation, and the Federal Aid for Education. And it is going to be a billion dollars that are going to go to different things like uh, like Elementary and Secondary Education Act that's going to give a billion dollars for teacher training and educational programs. So things going into schooling and trying to help increase the rigor of schooling that's happening. Um, you're going to see the increase of Medicare, which is going to kind of go hand in hand with Social Security. Some people are of a retirement age and they're elderly and they need health insurance providing for that. I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, it's going to have environmental reform programs. It's going to oversee the Department of Housing and Urban Development, aka HUD housing. If you've ever heard of HUD housing, um, that is allowing for the building of homes that are more affordable for lower levels of society, but it's also going to provide kind of subsidies to people who are going to be able to have a roof over the home. It's going to create the National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities. It's going to uh, pass an Immigration Act of 1965 that eliminates the quota system that had been placed in place since the 1920s. And so it's going to open up immigration to different nationalities in a way that it hadn't been before. It is going to try to provide for the fact that one fifth of Americans are living in poverty and LBJ is going to be uncomfortable with that and trying to kind of be combating that. Uh, he's also going to start Head Start programs, which is going to be nursery schools at a public school level, uh, job corps, upward bound programs. He's going to have the volunteers in service to America, uh, which is kind of like the Peace Corps. So just like so many different programs, so many different things. So kind of think of it as like the new deal, but different so i mean it has a lot of new deal kind of feel to it um but it's just like not not exactly the same um and so this obviously means that there's going to be more tax dollars that are spent and so i i think this cartoon really puts it into perspective of all the different things that this uh, administration LBJ is trying to fight for and pay for and you know make happen and it's just it's a lot going on at the same time we have the Cold War happening we have Vietnam we're gonna actually be fighting in Vietnam at this point we are gonna be having the Great Society happening at this point we're gonna be starting a lot of different programs of the Great Society so there's so many different kind of focuses happening at the same time that it's it's almost overwhelming but there's gonna be this idea of advocating through government avenues to make it happen so, Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is a federal insurance program that provides for people over the age of 65 um, or a qualified disabled or blind 
individuals that are uh, unable to provide for themselves. Medicaid is going to be benefits for low-income families, um, such as people with disabilities and things like that. Um, people who make a certain amount of money um, will apply, will be able to uh, qualify for Medicaid, um, although it takes a long time to be able to get approved in Medicaid. So, like, if you lose a job and it takes you six months to find a new job, like, that's not long enough. You have to think it'd be, like, a year or something. It's, like, a whole, it's a whole thing. It's, like, a whole process for bureaucratically run, which is, you know, if you ever been in VA, you know, is just tip-top shit. Okay. <laughs> that's sarcasm. Okay, so we have the Equal Pay Act. The Equal Pay Act is going to um, be put into place in... Sorry, there's someone at my door. Okay, so um, the Equal Pay Act is going to be passed in 1963, and this is going to forbid gender-based discrimination of people performing substantially, excuse me, equal work for the same employer. So that means that me as a teacher, and Mr. Kimball's a teacher, and if you know we start the same year, we're doing the same things, and we're equally qualified, we've done the same exact things, that we should be making the same pay regardless of the fact of our gender orientation. So um, you're going to see that it is the whole idea of you know equal effort equal skill equal responsibility and similar working conditions that they should be paid the same that it shouldn't come into fact of the criteria of your gender is not going to apply and this is going to be kind of a starting momentum as we get into the women's movement and another piece that is the foundation is this lady right here betty for dan that's how you say her name betty for dan and she writes this book called The Feminine Mystique, and she's going to publish it in 1963, which, you know, very ironically, same year as the Equal Pay Act. And in there, she's going to be like, you know, maybe, I'm going to say that maybe women don't want to just be in the drudgery of suburban housewifery, that perhaps they want to have opp opportunities outside the household. Maybe they don't want to be holden to their husbands. Maybe they don't want to marry. Maybe they don't want to have kids. And like, maybe that's okay that she's like if you want to you know live at home and you know just wait on your husband to get home and <laughs> make dinner and have kids and do that like that's totally fine but she's also like maybe she wants to do her own thing and that's okay so <clears throat> i think this quote from her really summarizes that main idea of the feminine mystique the only way for a woman as for a man to find herself as a person is by creative work of her own so betty for dan's like get out there and do your thing whatever that thing is so Betty Friedan is often credited for helping to launch and be a catalyst for the second wave of feminism. So the second wave of feminism, the first wave of feminism being the initial like feminist idea of uh, women's suffrage. So that's going to be the late 1800s into the early 1900s. And then it's kind of ends pretty much by 1919 when women get the right to vote. The second wave of feminism is going to begin around 1963, more or less, and go into the 1970s and die off when the RA is not passed, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then the third wave of feminism begins in like the 1980s um, and then really has just been continuing on. So, in our second wave of feminism, a very large organization that is going to be NOW, the National Organization for Women. We found it in 1966. It's going to call for equal employment opportunity, equal pay for women, and it's going to champion legalized abortion and passage of an equal rights amendment for women, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Just to put, in the, put all of this in perspective, um, women in this era, because I know you're like, they could do all the things that men could do. Um, they couldn't have bank accounts with their name on it. They couldn't, sorry, someone put my eyebrow speakers backwards and it's bugging me. Um, they couldn't get a credit card with their name on it. They couldn't get a loan for a house with their name on it. You had to have a man to co-sign with you. Um, there was a lot of discrimination <clears throat> for a lot of opportunities, a lot of access and things like that. Like when you applied for a job, they would ask you how quickly you could type, no matter what kind of job you wanted to apply for, you're gonna be a secretary until you got married or until you died and that was it. That very different world, very different expectations, a very different kind of place in society. Okay, so then that brings us to the women's liberation movement. So this is gonna be a result of the civil rights movement <clears throat> because after the discovery that the Civil Rights Act is not gonna be <laughs> enforced and women aren't gonna be kind of put into that, even though gender was included in the Civil Rights Act, um, they are going to be fighting against fighting against the patriarchy, which um, is the idea of a male-dominated society, um, and they're going to be fighting 
uh, seeing that as a idea of oppression and struggle and trying to go against that. They're going to be calling for equality of class and race. And specifically, they're going to be fighting for the uh, equality of women in education and job opportunities and things like that. They're going to call for an individual and collective action based on gender-based oppression, and they are going to call for actions that are going to help to reform education. All right, so then that's going to lead us into Title IX. Title IX is probably the most effective part of the women's movement in our second wave of feminism, um, and this is going to be passed in 1972, and it is going to be passed um, in schools, so all educational institutions, um, and it's not explicitly intended for sports, although that's the thing we can access the most is how we see it in sports. But the idea is that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participating participating in, be denied the benefits of, or subjected to discrimination of, under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So pretty much, they can't be like, hey, you're a lady, you can't take AP Calc because you're a lady. Um, they can't be like, hey, you're a man, you can't take home economics because you're a man and so you have that opportunity to do what you want to educationally. You can't be barred from an institution because of your your gender. Um, you can't, um, like for sports, you have to be provided equal access to, to things that if you decide you're a lady and you want to go wrestle, that you can because there isn't a program of equal opening that you can do that, that there's the idea of equal and open access. Okay. So then that's going to lead us into just women's activism. So we're going to see this in kind of yeah, the, main, the main ideas of um, we'll have what we call the sisterhood. This is going to be a new call for women's liberation. It's going to be young college educated females that are going to be well versed in kind of democratic ideology or new left ideology. Um, you're going to start to see terms like sexism and male chauvinism, I can talk, that are going to be used more commonly. They're going to become part of the the dialect of how we discuss things. Um, you see Gloria Steinem is going to become a very large figure when we talk about women's activism. Um, feminists are going to be defined by key goals. They are going to focus on things like child care, equal pay, abortions rights. Um, you're going to see that I feel like Sojourner Truth put this best, like way back in the 1800s, that there's the duality of women, she says. She says that, you know, I am a woman and I am black, is how she phrases it. That is this hard line between being a woman in American society, but also being a minority race and having to exist in both spheres and how that goes together. Um, and actually that's something that gets brought up quite a bit if you're, I don't know, a well-read individual. As we're in this third wave of feminism and people discuss that, the kind of duality of spheres of being a woman and being a minority in America and like how to go between that. Um, in the second wave of feminism, African-American and Latina women generally are going to stay on the periphery of the women's organizations that are mostly going to be white-led and they're going to be focused on the issues that white females are, are like campaigning for. Um, you're also going to see that sexual politics is going to be something they're focused on and that, I mean, is rep reproductive rights as well as awareness of sexual assaults and harassment um, in the workplace and things like that. <clears throat> this is an era where women are still held responsible for sexual assault and harassment regardless of anything, of anything. Um, so very rarely are cases taken to court, very rarely um, is anyone convicted and um, yeah, so just that's a whole thing. Um, there's also going to be the idea of getting women open access to birth control. That's going to be a huge movement at this time, as well as um, the abortion rights, which I'll talk about more at the end of this. You're going to see what they call the come out idea. This is going to be inspired by the Black Power Movement and Women's Liberation Movement. Men and women are going to be coming out and by identifying themselves as homosexual, aka coming out of the closet. Um, so they are going to be inspired by the women's movement and the civil rights movement, because honestly, the civil rights movement is the catalyst for everything else. 
Um, but they're all going to come together. So we have the come out movement, um, and that is going to kind of coincide with the Stonewall movement, <clears throat> which you learned about more in class, and the Chicano, um, and the uh, Red Power movement, and just one last one that I can't think of right now. But you learned about all that in class and kind of compare and contrast and kind of see how all these social justice movements go together and what they look like pulled together. Okay, so then we have the Equal Rights Amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment actually has been coming back up in the news like in the last month, which is wild. Um, but it is a constitutional amendment that originally was introduced in Congress in 1923, but it's not passed by Congress until 1972. And it states that the equality of rights under the law should not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on the account of sex. So it focuses on the idea of sex being a discriminatory pro like idea and that problem. <clears throat> has a ton of public support, but it doesn't require the necessary three-fourths support from the state legislators in order to be able to pass. Now, many states do pass this on their own, Maryland being one of them, but you're gonna see many states pass it on their own, um, and a few states very recently have passed it, <clears throat> like literally within the last month. I can't think of which state it was, but it was one of them, I can't, can't remember. But they pass it. And so this has been back up in the news again, um, especially as we talk about LGBTQI rights and we talk about um, transgender issues and we talk about the, the idea of that. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment has almost been refreshed in the news and controversy and discussion and all of that. And so that's actually come back yet again many years later. OK, so, you know, America, we uh, love good discourse. And uh, some of that discourse is going to be against the ERA. And uh, the main person who's going to be against the ERA is this lady, Phyllis Schlafly. Um, that's how you say her name right down there. You can say it, Phyllis Schlafly. Um, so <clears throat> STOP stands for Stop Taking Our Privileges. Equal Rights Amendment. Um, it's a grassroots organization founded by a, a right-wing leader, Phyllis Schlafly, um, and she's going to block the ratification of the ERA to the U.S. Constitution. She is going to be comprised mostly of women, um, anti-feminists um, that are largely evangelical, uh, that are going to be all about family values. Um, she's going to campaign to defeat the ERA, and she is going to pretty much just be like, you know, people want to stay and work at home and be all about that, that that's what they should be about. Um, I feel like this this uh, quote really just sums Phyllis Schlafly on up. Newsflash, one reason a woman gets married is to be supported by her husband while caring for her children at home. So long as her husband earns a good income, she doesn't care about the pay gap between them. So Phyllis Schlafly obviously was a stay-at-home mother and that was uh, something she was most concerned about. Um, and people didn't didn't take too kindly to this. This is a very famous moment where Phyllis Schlafly is going to get pied in the face. Um, it doesn't work out so well for her. Um, so she is quite a lady. Um, also, <laughs> Just a side note, um, she so while crusading for anti-feminist ideas, um, she also um, harbored some. Um, oh my gosh, the word is evading me right now. <sighs> Pregnancy is wild, guys. <sighs> the word when you're against people of Jewish descent. Oh my god, it's not it's, the word isn't isn't Nazi. It's when you're. You know, pregnancy, man, it's it's a thing. The word's gone. I'm sorry. You know what I'm talking about. But she uh, she has those ideas, and I'll probably think about it in five minutes from now. It's going to bug me. Um, but she's going to have those ideas as well. So a lot of, a lot of dynamics to this lady that is Phyllis Schlafly. Um, but she's going to be a crusader against the ERA, and she's going to pretty much um, help to defeat it, and she is going to uh, be a big leader against it. Okay, so Roe versus Wade. So this is all going to start off with a 25-year-old single lady. Um, her name is Norma McCovery, McCurvy, Cur whatever, um, aka Jane Rowe. And uh, she is going to challenge the criminal abortion laws in Texas that are going to forbid abortion at any weak gestation as unconstitutional. Um, <clears throat> 
um, except in cases where the mother's life is in danger. She's pretty much like, hey, Texas, like this is against my reproductive rights and against the rights that I have over my body. Um, and like the government can't tell me what to do. Um, so you are going to see that Henry Wade, who is the Texas Attorney General, is going to defend the anti-abortion law. Eventually, it is going to make its way up all the way to the Supreme Court. And when it gets to the Supreme Court, they are going to legalize abortions nationally. The court is going to say that the governments lack the power to ban abortions due to the decisions as protected by the 14th Amendment. And it is a 7-2-2 to two ruling. Um, <clears throat> So under the 14th Amendment, this pretty much protects a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy under the freedom of personal choice and family matters. Um, this is going to be interpreted differently in different areas of, in like different states of what trimester pregnancy that you can have an abortion. Generally, most states although there have been some states within the last couple of years, it's kind of changed a little bit. Um, you can have that abortion in that first trimester, that first three months of pregnancy. Um, but then as um, you enter into the second trimester, it's usually about halfway through um, because the Supreme Court raises the question because the question got raised last year um, about the, the what they call the viability question. At what point is a fetus viable? At what point does human life become human life? And I'm not here to tell you any of the answers on that. I'm not here to tell you my opinion. I'm not here to, to say any opinion on any of this at all. Okay, so it is up to you what you think about that. And you can maybe discuss that in your internet chat forums and with each other because discussion and discord is just an important part of the human existence, and especially American life. So, you know, just discuss it all out of what you think um, in a respectful manner because everyone's not going to always agree. Um, but the viability question of when human life begins. And so that is always the question as we talk about abortion rights um, in order to kind of really kind of put that in perspective of uh, the different viewpoints of what they think of when that happens and who's right then it becomes and like what legal issue there is. And it's just so many different things. So um, pretty much you're going to see that Roe versus Wade passes um, and <clears throat> I mean like it's declared like unconstitutional whatever and that um, abortion has to be a thing um, and it's part of the laws. You're going to see that 30 states are going to immediately have laws that are going to adopt abortion practices um, and they are going to uphold that um, in varying ways. and. Other states, it's going to be a continuing battle over time uh, over implementing that or not implementing that. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Oh, before Roe versus Wade, a lot of abortions that were done were done in very medically unsafe practices. Um, so I know Maryland, when they first started into um, legalizing abortion, the idea was trying to ensure that people were getting the medical attention that they needed and weren't going to be getting like abortions that were going to cause them to get like desperately ill and like bleed out and things like that. Okay. So now the analysis questions. So you are going to tell me how did those events I talked about like way back when, um, how do those lead into the second wave feminism? How do they provide the foundation in your opinion? Like what kind of foundation do they provide in order for the second wave of feminism to happen? How do you think the civil rights movement in the great society inspired and or paved the way for the women's movement? that like has pretty much been dormant, pretty much have been sleeping since, you know, we got the 19th Amendment passed. Like, how do we suddenly let go, you know what we want to happen? So many things. Like, how do those things inspire women to be like, let's make it go? Um, and then like, why do you think the Equal Rights Amendment's not passed? Like, what do you think about it to some states? Makes them go, mm, not for us. Like, what? what is something that is going to be holding them back in that sense. So think about that and think about kind of, you know, like what, what makes it all go around. Um, if you have questions, please you don't hesitate to sign up for key time right over there to come in before or after school to email me, to post your question at Moto, to write it on your homework, or maybe just ask it in class because someone else might have the same question as you. I hope you enjoyed.